we go. Well, please open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, some of you know because you, uh, you've been out to eat already this weekend, and uh, if you were in a place that had TVs, what are they showing on the TVs? College football has started. <laughs> well, there's probably not been a better three. Uh, I can watch pretty much any competition, any game that I want to, streaming it over the internet. Uh, scores are sent in real time to my phone, statistics on anything you can imagine at my fingertips at any moment, uh, probably much to my wife's chagrin because she's not into the sports like I am. So it's a distraction, right? But it's wonderful for me. We are spoiled. But it hasn't always been that way. It wasn't that long ago that your only option was to watch live what the big TV networks decided to show. Do you remember those days? One of the highlights of the weekend uh, was a show called, let's see it. Is it there? Wide World of Sports. You remember this? McKay, some old folks here. Yes, we remember this. And then there was this famous intro to the show. We'll put it up there. Spanning the globe. You can even hear the music right now, right? To bring you the constant variety of sport, the thrill of victory, and the agony of defeat. The human drama of athletic competition. And I know what you all are. The image you have in your head right screen. The, uh, the, the, the course crashing and tumbling off. He was okay. He survived. He wasn't even hurt that bad. Athletic competition. Sports has many aspects that compare to living by faith. In fact, let's be creative here. Let's tweak this TV intro to fit Hebrews 11. You ready? Spanning history to bring you the constant variety of the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat, the human drama of playing your part in God's plan. Is that a little too much? Okay. It really isn't because, listen, the Apostle Paul, he especially liked to use the imagery of sports to encourage the church, to encourage us to live by faith. Classic passage here is in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27. Okay, so if you know athletics, if you've competed in athletics, uh, you understand. run. Yes. Run gets the prize. Run in such a way as to get the prize. And he talks about everyone who competes in the games, he's talking about the Olympic Games, goes into strict training. Those athletes do it to get a crown that will not last. But we, followers of Jesus, we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. Okay? In a race, the runners are running directly to the finish line. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I have an opponent that I need to strike, uh, not just flail around. No, I strike a blow to my own body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. We just finished. We saw athletes who have dedicated their lives to the goal of competition. There was training. There was discipline. Hard, hard work. All for the fleeting glory of a medal a crown that will not last. So Paul is telling us here 
How much more valuable is the hard work, the discipline, the sacrifice? Told the young pastor Timothy in 1 Timothy 4. He was encouraging Timothy. He said, rather, Timothy, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. So practice these things. Immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. I love that verse. Not so that all may see that you're perfect, just people may see that you're making progress. So aspiring to be an Olympic athlete is not for the faint of heart, and only a few people will be able to do it. Aspiring to live by faith for God is similarly challenging, but anyone can do it. But it doesn't just happen. It requires a refining process, a process to grow us, to mature us, a process that will lead to progress. And it's worth it. That's what Paul is telling Timothy here. Godliness is of value in every way. But this process of refining requires force. It requires energy. So gold, we know, is refined where? Off the impurities. Athlete, in their training, in the gymnasium, followers of Jesus are refined in the challenges of living by faith in a fallen world. So as we finish Hebrews 11, we see how these men and women in this hall of faith were refined in a crucible of faith. And the preacher is encouraging his listeners, he's encouraging us, stay the course. The end result will be worth it. So here's our big idea today. Faith is refined outside our comfort zone. I like comfort. I like comfort. It's why it's called a comfort zone. Because we like it there. It's comfortable there. But that's not where we're refined. It's not where we grow. In a crucible right now, it's probably not comfortable has a good purpose to refine you, to purify you, to, to make something beautiful. Living by faith is an adventure that does involve thrills of victory, but also what may feel like the agony of defeat. God actually uses both. So let's pray. God, uh, prepare our hearts for what you want to say through your word here. Thank you for those who have gone before us. Lord, as we remember uh, not only what you have done on the cross, but we remember what your people have done as they've trusted you, as they've walked this road before us. Lord, would you remind us um, that you're good, you are sovereign, you do not change. Uh, and Lord, whatever we face in our lives, uh, for your purpose and for good. So open our eyes and open our hearts in Jesus' name, amen. Well, starting today in, in Hebrews 11, verse 29, we're actually finishing the section about Moses. And if you'll remember from two weeks ago, we talked about choices of faith, how, how important our choices are, how our choices can change the world. Um, first of all, how no decision of faith is too small, okay? 
Remember we talked about Moses' parents. You know, decisions of faith, to have a child, um, to disobey uh, the, the law of the land, but to submit to God and to, to man. Uh, no act of faith is easy. We saw that. But now starting in verse 29, we see this. No obstacle of faith is too big. Now we tend to see them as obstacles. Are there any obstacles to God? No, there's, there's no obstacles, but we call them obstacles, all right? God doesn't, but progress is made when our faith, first of all, overcomes what to us feels like impossible obstacles. Uh, starting in verse 29, in these three verses, we see three obstacles that living by faith has to overcome three choices that living by faith will lead to eventually. And this crucible of faith, uh, where God is refining our faith, is risky choices. So let's look at verse 29. By faith, the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land, but the Egyptians when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. Okay, so the, the obstacle here is danger. I mean, this was one of the greatest miracles in the Bible, the parting of the Red Sea, so Israel could escape the Egyptian army. And we're not going to retell the whole story, but, but I want you to see why the preacher includes this here. God had led them out of Egypt. He was taking them to the promised land. But if you look at a map, he didn't have to cross. They didn't have to cross the Red Sea. Okay? The, there were land-based routes to get there. You know, I'm a map person. I'd say, uh, no, there's a road. It goes straight there. But that's not where God led them. God didn't have to drown the Egyptian army. He could have wiped them out in other ways. But here's what God did. God led Israel into a pickle. Sea on one side, mountains and a hostile army on the other side of them. The people cried out in terror. We are going to die. Why? has God led us here? Why, God? Why? Have you ever been in that crucible? Have you ever asked that question when you find yourself in a pickle because you have obeyed God? Not because you disobeyed God, because you did what he told you to do. this because they've never really given obedience a chance. Obeying God, it is going to put you in situations where you have to make some risky choices. In this case, it was, am I going to follow Moses into the sea? Uh, yes, I, I see that God has parted the waters. That's crazy, but it doesn't look safe. Well, Israel didn't have many options. Um, but even so, they took a risk to cross the Red Sea with a wall of water on each side of them. And Hebrews 11.29 says, they did it by faith. It was dangerous. Sometimes God asks me, sometimes God asks you to do something that doesn't feel safe. Why does God choose this option? So what prevents us from overcoming this obstacle of danger? This is what we have to overcome. It's fear. Fear. 
Um, how often does fear keep us from doing what God is asking us to do? Are you resisting God because some, it seems risky? That's dangerous. Living by faith will require it to overcome impossible obstacles. God wants, this is what God wants to refine out of you. Like the impurities out of gold. He wants to refine the fear out of you. Maybe it's the risky choice of sharing the gospel. Maybe what feels like a a risky choice of, of loving an enemy. Maybe it feels like the risky choice of asking for help. Maybe it's being a whistleblower, standing up for what is right, doing the right thing. And fear causes us to say no to risky choices. Here's what happens to us. Our faith gets smaller. Our fear gets bigger. Next story here, the crucible of faith involves Absurd choices. Look at verse 30. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. We all know the story. Jericho was a strong, fortified city with an army of Canaanites inside. Okay, so the the obstacle here is foolishness. Foolishness. So after Israel crosses the Jordan River, um, much like they crossed the Red Sea, Israel must have been like, walled city? No problem. Look what God did to the Red Sea and to the Egyptian army. Okay, God, here's a walled city. Take it down. Well, then God gives them the plan. March around the city in silence. Okay, next day, what's the plan? God, do it again for six days. Then on the seventh day, okay, now march around the city seven times. Now, the people of Jericho might have been nervous on day one, but by day three, they must have been mocking Israel. Who do these guys think they are? Marching around the city. You know, this is getting ridiculous. Uh, in fact, the Hebrew leader Joshua told them not to say a word. It probably felt foolish doing that until the final day when they shouted and blew the trumpets and the walls fell down. Here's what I want you to know about that story. Marching around the city did nothing. Nothing. It did nothing. But obeying God, even when he asks you to do what seems absurd or foolish, that is everything. God saw their faith, their willingness to obey him even when it did not make sense, even when it seemed absurd. 1 Corinthians 1 says this. The word of the cross is what? It's foolishness. It's folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Do we have this on the screen? Okay, 1 Corinthians 1. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For Jews demand signs. Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Marching around the city in silence. That was a lot easier than trying to destroy the wall by force, but it didn't make sense. It was an absurd plan. And here's what gets in our way. 
looking foolish is uncomfortable. We don't like looking foolish. So what, what is it that's preventing us from overcoming this obstacle of foolishness? Pride. Yes, a lack of faith often too, but how often does pride keep us from doing what we know God is asking us to do? Okay, are you resisting God in something because it just seems absurd? It, it even seems foolish. I'm going to look foolish. See, pride, like is an impurity that God wants to remove from our hearts. But to do it, he has to place us in the crucible of risky choices, absurd choices, that will grow our faith. And then, in this crucible, there are these unexpected choices. Let's look at verse 31. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish. To the spies. Okay, so the obstacle here is reputation, resume, okay, it's, it's what are people going to think of me? Have you ever heard or said this? Oh, God can't really use me. I'm not really worthy of God's love. I don't really belong with these people. Oh, if you knew No one will ever accept me. If anyone should have felt this way, it was Rahab. If you don't know the story, okay, she's a Canaanite. She lived in the city of Jericho, the city the Hebrews were marching around. And before they marched, the Hebrews sent some spies uh, into the city, and God showed the spies that the people were afraid. But the spy, what God had done to deliver Israel, if she had been caught, she would have died for sure. But she made a decision of faith to believe. And she, so she told the spies, for the Lord your God, the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. So what prevents us from overcoming this obstacle of reputation? Shame. Shame. It's kind of the opposite of pride, but it's actually in the same family. Pride is all about me, and so is shame. They're both rooted in self-centeredness. So if you are feeling shame or that your past or your associations prevent you from playing a part in God's plan, that is an impurity. It's a lie that God wants to remove. And the crucible of faith is where God is giving you the opportunity to make an unexpected choice, to believe, to trust to live by faith. No one is beyond the reach of God. No one is beyond the reach of God's love. No reputation can be an obstacle to the person who chooses to live by faith. I mean, Rahab was a foreign prostitute. Talk about a problem. Her decision to believe changed the world. She's in the hall of faith. I mean, I imagine she'd like to move beyond the label Rahab the prostitute. I'm sure she's like, yeah, you know, that was a long time ago. I don't do that anymore. Can we just move on? But no, it's there in our Bible, in the hall of faith, Rahab everyone. God can use anyone in his plan. 
In fact, doesn't even mention it here in Hebrews 11. She played an even bigger role in salvation history. You know her, her descendants? Rahab, after this incident, she was welcomed into the people of Israel, the family of God. She married a man named Salmon, who was from the tribe of Judah. She had a son named Boaz, who married Ruth. In the Bible... She, Ruth was a Moabite foreign woman. Ruth and Boaz had a child. This is uh, Rahab's grandson. His name was Obed. Obed had a son named Jesse. Jesse had a son named David. King David. Now you can read all of this in Matthew chapter 1 because between David, it leads all the way down to Jesus. Talk about faith is too small. So, if you're going through a crucible, it's not comfortable, but you have to understand it is for your good. God is using it to refine your faith, to change the world. It's true for us. It was true for the listeners of this letter it has always been true throughout history. So the preacher continues in verse 32. Progress is made. Listen, the preacher realizes here he's running out of paper. <laughs> so he, he just lists off some names, some events. And again, he's writing, remember, these are Jews that have believed in Jesus, any Jewish listener would know the backstory to these names. So let's read verse 32. He says, what more shall I say? I could go on like this all day long. For time would fail me to tell of Gideon. He didn't tell the story. I'm not going to tell the story of each of these men, some of whom, frankly, uh, it's surprising to see them in the hall of faith. I mean, seriously? Samson? I thought he was indicted in the steroid era. <laughs> Performance enhancing drugs? I don't know. But here is something to glean if you do know these stories. The, these men all had to face some common circumstances where faith ended up making the difference. Um, so this crucible of faith we know is working when we encounter this faith that is countercultural first. All of these men lived during the time period we call the judges. Um, once Israel conquered the promised land, they, they settled down, built their cities, and for nearly 400 years, they lived under the lead. You know the story. This was not a great season for the people of Israel. Um, here is how this period of Judges begins, Judges 2. The people served the Lord all the days of Joshua. And all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110 years. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. And they provoked the Lord to anger. And then in Judges 21, the final verse in the book says this. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. I mean, is there any better description of our world today? Living by faith has never been more countercultural. But you're not the first one to have your faith refined by this crucible. 
So what is it that happened to Israel's faith? Why did they abandon the Lord in one generation? Well, here's, here's one theory. They got comfortable. Once they conquered the land, they had houses and fields and cities and vineyards. These were blessings from the Lord. But comfort zones are dangerous. We forget that we're not home yet. Uh, this is a real danger for us in Naples. I mean, it was great to get away on vacation last week, but as, as, as our vacation was ending, how did we feel about coming back to Naples? Wow, that's pretty awesome. You know, we get to go home to where people go on vacation. You know, this is great here. But see, when we get comfortable, we often hesitate to make decisions of faith that make us uncomfortable, that put us at odds with our culture. Uh, but this is what happens when we, when we play it safe, when we love fitting in, grow, it actually shrinks. Faith is refined where? Outside our comfort zones. And God loves you enough to know what you need to make progress. Um, so the second common circumstance that these men face, that we will face, uh, where this crucible of faith is working is this, when faith is against the odds. Every one of these people in Hebrews 11 faced huge challenges. But as we know, there were times when God seemed to purposely make the odds worse, like just for fun. Uh, Gideon faced a massive Midianite army and God reduced his army from 32,000 down to 300. And then he gave them trumpets and torches as weapons. David was a shepherd boy. He was not a soldier. Yet God had him face Goliath with five stones and a sling. If you feel like Living by faith in God stacks the odds against you. From a human perspective, you're right. It's the perfect crucible for God to purify us as he leads us home. But if you're not feeling up to it, don't worry. You're not alone there either. Okay? Common circumstance number three. The crucible of faith is working when faith is flawed. Did I mention Samson earlier? That guy was seriously flawed. Gideon was hiding. He needed lots of convincing that God was calling him. Barak was afraid and needed Deborah the prophetess to spur him on. Jephthah? Seriously? Jephthah? He's an outlaw. He made a foolish vow that cost the life of his daughter. The Hall of Faith? Seriously, can't we pick some better examples for the Hall of Faith? Even Samuel, if you know the story, he was not a good father. David committed murder, committed adultery. The Bible doesn't try. That should be good news for you and me. Now, they all paid a price for their flaws. Sin has consequences. But God is looking for faith. See, our obedience matters because... It shows what's in our hearts. But God is not evaluating us at the end of the day based on our performance. He is looking for faith. 
In fact, God uses our flaws. God uses our failures. These are things that are common to all of us. And he uses them often to put us in circumstances that are uncomfortable, that serve as a crucible to refine our faith. So, what happened when all of these people choose to live by faith? Two things. One, we get the thrill of victory, but we also get the agony of defeat. Okay, the consequences in this life for living by faith were all over the map from what we would consider good to bad. But that's the final lesson in the Hall of Faith. Progress is made when our faith transcends life's consequences. Okay, so to transcend something is to rise above. consequences, it means my faith sees beyond the consequences that happen to me in this life. It is the assurance of things hoped for, it's verse 1, the conviction of things not seen. So, fasten your seatbelts. The crucible of faith is where we experience these three things. It's, it's what Hebrews 11 tells us, starting in verse 33. Let's read a couple more verses. He lists these other people who he says, who through faith, here's what happened. They conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Okay, we'll stop there. The triumph of Christ. All of these triumphs reminded the listeners of specific stories of faith that ended in triumph, uh, the thrill of victory, like Daniel in the lion's den. But when Daniel was in the lion's when he was thrown in the lion's den, what did Daniel expect was going to happen? He prayed for deliverance, but I imagine Daniel thought, yeah, this is the end. triumph. Okay, his faith transcended the consequence of what was going to happen to him. This is basically what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. Right there in verse 34, quenched the power of fire. Do you remember the story? The Jews were in exile in Babylon. King Nebuchadnezzar demanded everyone bow down to a 90-foot golden statue or be thrown in a of faith to obey God and live or die with the consequences. There was no guarantee. And I love these words, so let's put them on the screen. Daniel 3, Nebuchadnezzar answered them and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? I can't believe it. Now, I'm going to give you a chance. If you're ready, when you hear the sound of every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Well, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image 
that you have set up. Didn't matter what the consequences were going to be. They were looking beyond faith that transcends consequences. The reward is not here. So sometimes the crucible of faith is where we experience the second thing, the suffering of Christ. Let's continue, verse 35. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. Uh, they were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. All of that was a very real possibility for the readers of this letter. Nero was on the horizon. They had already experienced persecution of Claudius, had their possessions taken, they were kicked out of Rome. That was 10 years earlier. Nero was about to happen. And the preacher is just giving them full disclosure. Listen, living by faith can result in the thrill of victory. But if it does not, you get the thrill of defeat. Because there's no consequence in this life that can take away your inheritance of the better place of heaven. I mean, the Apostle Paul told the Philippian church, listen, for me to live is Christ. To die is what? It's gain. Listen, he said, I've counted all things as a loss compared to this surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, the power of his resurrection, and the sharing of his sufferings. So, Paul tells the Philippian church, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. See, when that is how you view life, um, then whatever crucible you might encounter or experience, this is where you experience the third thing, the affirmation of Christ. Let's read the last few verses, starting in verse 39. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. God sees, he's watching. He loves you. He knows what is best for you. But here's the reality. Life is not all about you. Okay, these heroes of faith did not receive what was promised. It, it's coming, but they didn't get it yet because God was not finished. God has a plan and it's for his glory. It's not for ours. But he's given you a part to play. And if we don't play our part, it's not just we who suffer. Suffer. See, God's plan is a team endeavor. It's a team endeavor. We wouldn't be here if someone had not handed us the baton of faith. We have to run our leg of the race, pass the baton to others. And he's wanting, the preacher here is wanting us to know, don't be afraid of the crucible. It's not comfortable. But God is using the crucible to refine us. So when the heat gets turned up, and life gets uncomfortable, here's what we do. We lean in, we press on, we look beyond. Now, I don't know if uh, he was a man of faith, but I love this quote. I'm going to put it on the screen. It's from President Theodore Roosevelt over 100 years ago in his uh, article or book called Strenuous Life. And this was his perspective. Far better it is to dare mighty things 
to win glorious triumphs, even though checkered by failure, than to rank with those poor spirits who neither enjoy much nor suffer much, because they live in the gray twilight that knows neither victory nor defeat. It's a comfort zone. It's far better when we get out of our comfort zones. We trust God. We obey God, no matter what the consequences are. So whatever it is that you are facing, that you may be in, you're not the first, and God will use it. Amen? Amen. Well, let's, let's pray. Lord, thank you for those that have gone before us. Sorry? Thank you for the encouragement that we get when we see people making risky choices, absurd choices, unexpected choices. Lord, if those people had said no, it's uncomfortable, it's too dangerous, it seems foolish, Lord, where would we be? So God, thank you for those who have gone before us who who stayed in the crucible, who were faithful, who trusted you. Lord, thank you for those who saw great victories. But Lord, we can also thank you for those who, from a human perspective, it may have felt like defeat. But Lord, it wasn't. Because the reward was in heaven. So help us, Father, if we're in a crucible, to not give up, to not quit, to trust you and your presence, that you will hold us, that you will strengthen us.